continuing in Stockbridge at the moment, just uh, leaving Edinburgh Academy to safely cross over the street here. Joe didn't actually mention, and I'm surprised he didn't on this occasion, uh, this uh, was a location in the prime of Miss Jean Brodie because the gates at the far end there in the early part of the, the, the movie, the children can be seen coming out of there if you're a fan of the, the prime of Miss Jean Brodie. Now we are going to go down a very old part of town which was a separate settlement and it was called Silver Mills. Now Silver Mills today is part of Edinburgh, it's just all been brought into this big city. It originally was a place of industry, particularly in the 17th, 18th century. There was a lot of uh, tanneries, uh, tanning of leather, which was very smelly. And originally, silver milling took place here. And two of our great kings, James the Fourth and James V, were well into alchemy alchemy, experimenting with uh, different substances and so on. And silver ore was known to exist near Linlithgow, in fact near Livingston today in West Lothian. And they brought it in to refine it here and smelt it here. Uh, but then they found out that it, after so long it wasn't worth all the effort and uh, the processing of silver ore kind of died a bit of a death, but uh, that's where it gets the name Silver Mills. It was very industrial. Today uh, we'll just go over in the corner here, first of all. There's a lot of modern apartment buildings, but there are shades of the old uh, mills, industrial centres. Uh, this house is called, whoops, there's a uh, only in a live tour, although we are, <laughs> we are uh, experiencing uh, vehicles moving and so on, so we're just keeping s safe. Uh, so the house you're seeing there is called Silver Mills House, and if you notice the beautiful stonework, uh, that building goes back to about 1760s. It predates the buildings of Edinburgh's new town, and it uh, was occupied by a gentleman called John. Lauder and John Lauder owned a tannery here. He was very wealthy and he had a family and one of his sons is probably more better known today than John Lauder and he is Robert Scott Lauder and he was a painter, a portrait painter and a very fine one uh, as well and he was back in the 18th century, early 19th century, he was producing quite modern atmospheric paintings and I can show you one of his examples here in my book. This is of David Roberts and we're going to be speaking about him later on, the subject of this uh, picture. So it's a painting of a painter. And David Roberts was into Asian uh, art, he was into what was called Orientalism and he loved uh, dressing up in various different costumes but this painting is by Robert Scott Lauder and if you notice how the paint uh, flows like Rembrandt he was uh, influenced by these people and very much a painter's painter. He wasn't filling in outlines, he was uh, truly producing an expressive piece of work. So an amazing painting now. Scott Lauder is probably better known for illustrations of Sir Walter Scott's novels like Rob Roy and Heart of Midlothian and of course he was uh, around when Sir Walter Scott was around and Walter Scott was always going to encourage artists to illustrate his stories so he's known through that as well. He married uh, John, the Reverend John Thompson's daughter and he was an amateur painter who stayed in Duddingston and he went after his marriage to visit Italy, came back to London and then came back to Edinburgh uh, to teach art at the Trustees Academy. But that was a bit of his downfall because the traditions here in Edinburgh and painting were more towards drawing and draftsmanship and free-flowing painting wasn't quite so popular. So he tends to be one of the more obscure uh, painters in Scottish history. But he 
uh, stayed at this house. This was his father's house, uh, Silver Mill's house, and one of the few remaining uh, 1760s uh, houses in this part of town. So we're going to keep moving. So you could imagine the mills here and almost the architecture it has a wee bit of the flavour of milling buildings and industrial buildings. But uh, if you're talking about going back to the 18th century, you wouldn't want to be coming down here in a hurry. It would be so smelly and polluted and smoky. There'd be a lot of noise going on with industry, with milling, with tanning of leather. And uh, yeah, different. Now this is by an artist called Aeon Bridge and it was uh, completed in about 1997. Ian Bridge, uh, he has another sculpture similar to this in Rutland Square in Edinburgh, more in the West End. And it has a horse, figure and eagle. And it's uh, a kind of abstraction because the horse's head is turned around. But it doesn't really matter because it makes it all the more dramatic. So there's a flavour of abstraction in this piece of public art. And I love public art because you can get up close to it and enjoy it. Uh, the interconnection of the figures was paying homage to paintings where uh, horses and riders figured very much in the history of art. So there's a bit of that also. So Ian Bridge this uh, piece of public art. So we're going to move through Silver Mills. And if you notice the cobbles, that was for uh, horses and horses would be pulling carts of supplies and materials. So very necessary that they didn't slip on the cobbles. And we're going uphill now. This is in the Craig Leith stone which was a local stone and uh, Joe mentioned in an earlier tour that uh, it's quite moist and it tends to absorb smoke and darken. This would have been a kind of very golden colour of stone but today it's more grey. This is St Stephen's Church. We're coming to the end of uh, St Stephen's Street. Just ahead of us was a uh, 18th century street which uh, suffered through a great fire and has been rebuilt and rebuilt. Uh, this uh, church is in the Grecian Baroque style of architecture and Baroque tends to be quite a heavy style of architecture. It was built by quite a famous architect in the 1820s called William Playfair and it's in an unusually restricted site, not really where it was originally planned to be. And uh, within here is an octagonal uh, hall, uh, main performing space, because today it is not a church, because we had a lot of churches, and with a decline in church going, we find we had surplus churches, and would you believe this one was up for sale? in uh, just maybe about 10, less than 10 years ago and uh, there was various ideas. What was it going to be? It was going to be maybe apartments. It was maybe going to be restaurants and cafes. But it was bought by, or rather taken into ownership, by Peter Schaffers. Peter Schaffers, I've spoken to you about before, who had the Rose Theatre and Rose Street, and he was his director of the Royal Danish Ballet. And he thought this would be a great performing space, which was the central hall in the church. And that's what it is today. It, uh, the tower on the church, let me get, uh, get this right in terms of uh, metres, uh, <laughs> I think uh, it's probably going to be about 140 odd uh, feet uh, to the top there. Um, and it's uh, going to be oh, about 50, 49 metres high. So it's quite high and stands out quite a lot here. The inside is a Willis organ, a Willis manufactured by Father Willis, which is the foremost Victorian organ maker. And it's got a very fine sound inside also. Now, there is a story about St. Stephen's that the architect had a bit of a 
difference of opinion with William Byrne, who built Edinburgh Academy, and they didn't get along too well. And because of that, William Playfair built this church to block the view of Edinburgh Academy. So if you were at Edinburgh Castle, you would not see William Byrne's beautiful masterpiece of architecture, which uh, Joe was talking about before, but we're not entirely sure if that is true, but uh, it's, it's a beautiful church, lovely church. Now, we've got another church just behind us here. This church here is St Vincent's Chapel, and a beautiful piece of architecture it is, and I've uh, drawn and painted this. It's a favourite subject of mine. It is in what we call the decorated Gothic style of architecture, and it began to develop in the, oh, it's about the 1840s, 1850s, there was a bit of a difference of opinion within the Scottish Episcopal Church and worshippers and people who were preachers uh, didn't really like what the bishops were saying and they broke away to connect more with the English congregation. So this was more like a full English Anglican church for a period and there are certain areas of the architecture, if you notice the tracery in the windows there, which is very much in this English decorated style of architecture. It is the most beautiful. Now you may wonder where the word St Vincent's comes from and why is this area called St Vincent Street? Well, it was uh, a man called James Jervis who was a Napoleonic admiral active uh, along with Nelson at certain uh, naval warfare in the late 18th, early 19th century. And he, for his uh, accomplishments, he was uh, made Lord Admiral Vincent, uh, which connected with the Battle of Cape St. Vincent. So he was also a member of Parliament and he was quite a strong figure. So that is why it is called St. Vincent's Chapel after this guy. Now that isn't the end of the story because in the 1970s, the, a group, the Order, you get this right as well, the Order of St. Lazarus of Bethlehem, of Bethlehem uh, took over this property and uh, used it as their chapel and it was a fraternal order, much like a Masonic order, but then it passed eventually to the Scottish Episcopal Church and that's what it is today and if we look up the road to the left hand side if Joe can point it out if you see where it says Cumberland Street if you go around the corner and go one story up you'll see three central windows on that tenement building with uh, architraves above with little bits of masonry sticking out above these windows that was the rectory would you believe that was where the head man stayed uh, to connect with the chapel here of St Vincent and around the corner, but we're not going to go around the corner at the moment, down St Stephen Street is what uh, used to be the church hall, which is now a dance school. Uh, so it did own various properties. Now if we look, we're going to turn to the right, we're going down Circus Lane. And if you notice on the corner is the St Vincent Bar. And just now it is okay to sell carryouts which means people will come to this small window and purchase alcohol. They will bring empty milk, cartons and bottles even, and get them filled up with beer because the pubs are closed uh, for consuming alcohol just now. So we're going to walk down Circus Lane. And you can admire the wonderful windows of uh, St Vincent's Chapel on the right hand side, Circus Lane. I don't know if you've heard the word Insta Instagram ability. Instagram ability. Bloggers from all over the world recommend coming to this little street to take selfies and take photographs. And it's the most said to be the most picturesque street in Edinburgh, if not Europe, if not the world, uh, with photographers especially. The people that live here can be entertained with it being very busy, but maybe not always entertained. And there is the term tutting tourists, meaning people
people photographing people's front door and then the resident will come out the door and the tourist will say, tut, 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 tut. you're spoiling my picture, which is <laughs> a bit crazy. It used to be for stable workers, people who looked after the horses and coaches. It goes back to the 18th century. And they have here what we call upside down houses. And that means the bedrooms are on the ground floor and the living quarters up the stairs. If Joe likes to maybe just get a little view uh, going back to St. Stephen's Tower <coughs> with the old lamp. <coughs> you can maybe get an idea of how this is such a, a popular street. Circus Lane. Uh, people come in costumes and they go into the St. Vincent Bar and they use the toilets as changing facilities. And the staff, the owner of the St. Vincent Bar doesn't mind very much because he says, oh, they'll probably buy a cup of coffee and they'll change into their gear. So there are many wedding shoots which take place down here. Swimwear suits. I think Joe and I would agree it's not a really day to do a swimwear suit, a shoot in, uh, <laughs> in Edinburgh. But that happens. And acrobats, there's been acrobatic performances and to advertise the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. It's uh, so Instagram ability if you've not heard that one before, because that, of course, is the photo sharing site. And to get one-upmanship, you come to Edinburgh, you come to Circus Lane, and all your friends admire your pictures. Very quaint doorways here, very picturesque doorways, hanging baskets, plant pots. And there's businesses, there's offices here as well. It's in that Craigleith sandstone, which is very nice. So, Circus Lane. Circus because Royal Circus, which is a circular terraced block designed by William Playfair, is just behind here. And this would be to accommodate the carriages, the horses and carriages and service the families of these wealthy people who stayed up in Royal Circus. And it was said that Royal Circus was the original place that St. Stephen's Church was planned to have been sited. It's just, it's amazing because people can put their own stamp of their personality on these houses. Great feeling of individuality. Christmas tree or illuminated fairy lights in there. You may be surprised to see that traffic comes down here and this is another thing that the residents would like to stop and there has been a move to place bollards at the end of the street because this is what we call in Edinburgh a rat run in that if you want to take a shortcut you come down Circus Lane and you probably come down it quite fast and uh, with the cobbles that can be quite noisy. This is the Bailey Bar and there was a pub here going back to the 1870s and it was called the Grand Bar back then and it was very much what we call a spit and sawdust type of bar. It was male only although there was a little reserved area for ladies called the Snug and of course not very convenient for ladies coming here back in the 19th century because there was no toilets uh, for the ladies but nowadays that has all changed it's a local hub for people to come and socialise it's got great atmosphere wonderful food it's got an island bar in the centre and many of the locals come here to chat and exchange news. A lot of the stock bridgers like to come to the Bailey and I must mention it's the most dog friendly of all bars here so it's you'll never go in here without seeing a dog. It's great, the Bailey Bar. 
Now, I'm going to speak about something that Joe's actually already mentioned, but I'm going to tell you another spin on it. If look over the street, it's the Doubtfire Gallery. Now, he mentioned Madame Doubtfire, who had the bric-a-brac old clothing shop uh, close to here. This wasn't it, actually, but uh, the Doubtfire Gallery was sited originally where this lady's shop was. Uh, why is there a connection between Madame Doubtfire and the Robin Williams film? It's because of Anne Fine, who was a, or is a children's author. She was uh, well known as the Children's Laureate. And she wasn't an author originally, but one day she, she was ha having a bit of a problem because she was keeping, wanting to keep her daughter, her young daughter, entertained. And it was heavy snow and she couldn't get to the library. So she thought, I'm just going to start writing um, myself. And she did. And a whole series of most successful books, including uh, Madame Doubtfire. The, this lady, Anne Fine, um, is part of a group of people who say that books should be books. Now you may wonder, what does that mean? And it means non-genderifying stories. So that stories should be equally accessible for boys and girls and we shouldn't have stories for girls and stories for boys. So, Doubtfire Gallery, the connection which uh, Joe spoke about earlier on. Stockbridge was very much a down at heel village going back to the 17th century and before that. It was a passing through place. The main reason for its growth was the fact it was one of the best crossing places off the water of Leith. And we've got the old stock bridge which dates back to the 19th century but there was many earlier bridges here and they would be used for transporting livestock, sheep, cattle, you name it. And it was industrial. There was mills, there was tanneries here as well. There was a huge amount of noise and the people were hugely poor. It was with Henry Rayburn, the Edinburgh portrait painter, and uh, who had two estates here. And a lot of his acquisition of wealth came from a very good marriage to a local lady. And he got one of his friends, who was an architect, to help him to develop the place into a residential centre to become very fashionable. It had previously been a, a kind of con congregating place for the sewerage from Edinburgh's new town. All the bad sewerage and waste would come down the hill and naturally come into this area. So it took a lot of doing for Rayburn to tweak it. And he was up against it. But today, it's very bohemian. It's very desirable. And many quite wealthy residents here, artists, poets, musicians. And we look over the stock bridge here. Uh, it's going to be a wee bit difficult because we've got a bit of social distancing to do. But here is where they hold the duck race. And it's held in the summer when a thousand plastic yellow ducks are thrown from this bridge and they all have numbers on them and people will go and buy a number from the local pub, restaurant, cafe, whatever and be raising money for charity. There is a prize but you're raising money for St Columbus Hospice which is a cancer charity uh, here in Scotland. So we're going to cross over, have another look over the bridge at the other side. See how busy it is more charity shops down here than most other parts of Edinburgh. They hold a market here uh, on a Sunday afternoon and it's very very busy not just with the locals but people who come from all over Edinburgh 
and further afield to the Stockbridge market. There was an original market place which goes back to the 1825, but uh, the market today is held in another site. We're going to have a look over the bridge at this sculpture. Now this is part of uh, an installation uh, by Turner Prize award-winning artist Anthony Gormley and it's called Six Times and it's six human figures in a lot, no, in cast iron, I should say. And they are positioned all the way from the Gallery of Modern Art, which is about a mile or so away, where the first figure is only head and shoulders showing. But would you believe the whole sculpture is beneath that? The whole figure was implanted into the paving underneath where we walk. And all these other figures go along the water of Leith and end up at a disused pier in Leith. Originally planned to tilt and submerge under high water, but they didn't survive that, so they were all taken away and then eventually put back today. An anonymous, got it right, this time anonymous uh, person put money up to have them re-established. But these figures do not tilt anymore, which is probably quite a good idea. But I love it. I love Anthony, Anthony Gormley's uh, work. He's a very clever sculptor. Yeah, these trees are all tilted, as you can see. They're all leaning over, which makes them even more special. This nice open green space. And ahead of us is this old house called Duncan's Land. And it was a merchant's house. But people looking at it think well, it's actually older than it actually is. It was built in the 18th century and it was from the stones of demolished buildings in Edinburgh's old town dating back to the 17th century. So it was like put together, if you like, with older stone. And you can see it's like a jigsaw puzzle. It's the most amazing. Now, it's also a restaurant today, but here was born one David Roberts, and if you remember the picture I showed you earlier of the gentleman in the turban, that was David Roberts. David Roberts was self-taught. He was a house painter. He was a scenery painter. He painted for the circus and for the theatre. And he got a bit of a reputation for himself. He travelled to uh, Egypt and the Near East. He was fascinated by Asian culture and Asian art and uh, he became an accomplished landscape painter and I can show you this picture shortly of one of his paintings David Roberts's painting this is of St Patrick's Church in the old town of Edinburgh and uh, he was said to paint quite in a quite a modern style and that is the case because some of it is quite flat it's all finely drawn very different to the earlier picture I showed you of Robert Scott Lauder, which was a bit more atmospheric, but nonetheless a great artist and famous son of Stockbridge. And if you look at the house today, you'll see it is a Thai restaurant. And just above the door, it says Fear God Only, uh, with uh, 1605 on the lintel that was imported from an earlier building up in Edinburgh's old town. So that is not original, but nonetheless, it's a very beautiful building, very quaint. Now, if you look up the hill, it's Gloucester Lane, and that was the old thoroughfare from the village of Stockbridge, if we're talking about going back 17th or 18th century, and that would take you to St Cuthbert's Church uh, up in the old town. So I'm just going to wrap up there and hope you enjoyed our tour of beautiful Stockbridge. See you next time.